Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be here in Vilnius and talk a little bit about the um, uh, type of research I'm doing. So very briefly, what I want to talk about today is uh, say a few words about the theory, sort of theoretical background uh, uh, where I come from. Then uh, a little bit um, talk about um, the research I've done on uh, comparing Estonia and Slovenia uh, in terms of uh, internet diffusion and then talk about some of the examples uh, on the basis of Estonia. So heavily I will focus on some of the Estonian cases uh, and, uh, and to illustrate some of the key theoretical points and the insights uh, about technology diffusion. And, um, uh, and those Estonian cases, some of them are, uh, you know, what you could call just, you know, successful or pretty good cases, and some of them are not so successful or heterogeneous or maybe failures, depending on where you stand or your, your viewpoint. But um, very briefly, um, my background is in um, uh, where the type of research I do can be classified as a comparative political economy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in uh, political economy of. Um, political economy of uh, innovation and uh, technology. So, as an introduction, I could sort of say that, uh, you know, what I, what I, what I want to do um, really is that my, my research agenda is very much about sort of trying to understand the um, diffusion of innovations uh, in different national and local contexts. So it's really a combination of different levels of analysis and macro comparing different countries, sort of meso and micro processes within the countries. And if you look at that type of research, you will see that uh, some of the research tends to be very um, sort of reductionist in the sense that people basically say that, well, it all depends on the national wealth, you know, how higher is a per capita GDP, higher per capita GDP is, more sort of innovations or technologies you have, more likely I use them more likely uh, you adopt them and so on. Um, at the same time, there are sort of um, alternative views. Alternative views basically argue that, well, it's all about institutions. Institutions, I will come to this point, what they are, but, you know, very roughly rules of the game. Um, but I, I find that both of those appro approaches tend to be very sort of, um, um, yeah, sort of linear, very reductionist. Um, and um, actually the processes behind technology adoption, diffuse and use, um, they're much more messier. Particularly if you take a little bit more detailed look, they're certainly not linear, they're much more non-linear. And something that I try to focus on is the sort of what I call entrepreneurial discovery process and how that interacts with institutions, institutional complexity. So as I said, the work is primarily about Estonia, a little bit on Slovenia. Um, first sort of theoretical point is that I tried to integrate this, those sort of various institutionalist uh, perspectives into um, uh, the work. And that for me means that um, I'm including, trying to include both what we call formal institutions and informal institutions. So um, you may be, uh, may be aware of institutional economics, um, uh, it's, it's relatively easy to measure formal institutions, right? So, uh, formal institutions or rules of the game, uh, you know, laws, uh, legislation, that kind of stuff. Informal institutions are, uh, you know, culture, mental models, habits of behavior, and so on. So, and if you, if you also look at some of the examples um, I will be talking about later on, you will see that um, uh, the methodologies that I have used are very, very diverse. Okay, so there is no, um, you know, th th that kind of approach also means that um, your method is not determining the research questions you're asking, it's vice versa, meaning that your research question is actually determining the methods you're using, okay? Uh, often in economics, I think that uh, people basically uh, take a method and then they will see what they can do with that. Uh, and that's why maybe some of the interesting research questions are not asked. So some of the stuff I will show you is based on econometrics, some of, some of the stuff is more qualitative, uh, more descriptive and so on. And I think sort of the emphasis really um, in, in, in my work is more on sort of sociological and historical institutional rather than sort of very rational choice type of institutionalism and uh, 
and the emphasis is also on uh, institutional complexity. So uh, institutional complexity means that you, you may have lots of very different rules. Those rules kind of uh, interact with each other. Uh, they are maybe in conflict with each other, informal rules, formal rules. Uh, you will see that later. So um, here is a um, sort of example of um, what I would think is sort of relatively rational choice approach to institutionalism and uh, how uh, institutions matter for technology diffusion. So that this quote is from uh, Helen Milner, who's a professor at uh, Princeton University. And uh, here, obviously, the assumption is that people are uh, you know, able to see what their kind of interests or preferences are and uh, um, are uh, very clearly able to identify themselves um, uh, who are the losers and who are the winners from those uh, uh, games. And you know, later on when we talk about Estonia, we'll see some of that um, also played out in Estonia, but I think in some extent it's also about perception, uh, whether you will see yourself as a loser or winner in a particular situation. I think I'm, I'm much more sort of influenced by the way Paul Pearson has approached the institutions, basically sort of saying that, uh, well, obviously, uh, um, uh, human action matters, but uh, we cannot say that the outcomes we will see that those are the result of the human design, right? So they are often sort of unintended consequences. Uh, they are not uh, the lip, you know, they are not the outcome that we, we, we perhaps intended. And uh, and something that I think matters very much in the technology diffusion is something what we call back dependence, right? So. Uh, so those, those sort of long quotes, they're not here to, uh, that I will read all of them, but, but basically again uh, emphasizing that often you know, some decisions are made because of historical accidents, right? And those uh, enforce us into a bad, depend uh, bad dependent processes and obviously those processes don't determine the outcomes um, um, completely, but they at least sort of um, tend to limit the choices we have. Um, and, um, and then I have this um, other sort of um, theoretical insights that I'm sort of trying to combine here with institutionalism and I think some of the stuff Don has uh, talked about and you may, may be quite familiar but there is this sort of uh, vast literature on entrepreneurial discovery. You know, obviously Schumpeter but there is a much more sort of uh, more recent literature on that uh, uh, basically seeing entrepreneurs as a key um, and those, those in innovation outcomes because they are uh, risk takers. And um, in that sense, um, perhaps the more recent literature even sort of emphasizes, but it doesn't always even happen in the private sector, but also may, under certain circumstances, be case in the public sector. And um, sort of the last set of literature that I am, I'm trying to bring in is um, sort of trying to emphasize that technology is not something objective. Okay. Technology is not something, the way we use it, it's not something universal, but our mental models, different perceptions, and um, uh, sort of tacit nature of technology matters very much. In different sort of circumstances, in different national, local contexts, we may use technologies quite differently. And, you know, I will illustrate this point with some of the examples on the basis of um, Estonia. Um, uh, so, um, starting with the first sort of empirical topic, um, what I've done um, is um, um, looking at sort of the differences in the internet diffusion on the basis of Estonia and Slovenia. It's sort of comparative um, uh, descriptive analysis, sort of historical analysis, looking at uh, uh, different variables and basically sort of, I started doing it um, first time um, something uh, like 13 years ago when Estonia and Slovenia were both considered relatively uh, you know good in ICT particularly in the central Eastern European um, context but what I have what I have seen over the years is that uh, um, um, sort of the technology especially if we measure it by lots of different variables not just one or two variable uh, internet use in Estonia has been uh, kind of uh, growing more rapidly. You know, the use is much more intensive and much more sort of extensive than in um, uh, Slovenia. And it's often better quality. 
uh, speeds are higher, people use it for longer time periods for more sophisticated activities than Slovenian uh, users. And um, that probably um, has to do uh, with sort of the supply side conditions in Estonia, so, um, which are, uh, um, uh, which are um, uh, much um, uh, better than in Slovenia. You know, Slovenia is uh, much wealthier than Estonia, per capita GDP is higher actually. So if you would believe in this uh, hypothesis that the wealth determines the uh, use of technology, then uh, this uh, assumption, at least in this case, doesn't work very well. But um, what uh, Estonia, I think, has done differently is that uh, from the early 1990s, you have had a much more sort of uh, uh, liberalization in the telecom sector, much more sort of stable rules of the game. Uh, you know, the, the, the incumbent telecom company was privatized, while in Slovenia, all of those things have been you know, relatively slow to take place or they have not happened. So, and what is also quite interesting is that uh, um, if you look, for instance, in, uh, sort of IT skills, there are no sort of considerable differences. And um, there are some of the illustrations what I would find really interesting. For instance, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to go through all the data and all the variables that I have used in this analysis. It's more an illustration, and I try to emphasize my key point. But there is something very interesting um, um, uh, that I have found. Uh, we were talking about inequality in, in the U.S. Uh, before. Here is a Gini coefficient of Estonia and Slovenia, and also compared with the EU average, but for this purposes it doesn't really matter. So it turns out that Slovenia is actually much more, it's not only wealthier in per capita terms, but it's also much more equal place than Estonia. Okay? It has a sort of Scandinavian, Swedish levels of uh, Gini coefficient, right? Estonia is much more sort of unequal, you know, it's more, more unequal than uh, average of the so-called new member states or average of the EU, as you, as you see from this data. But what is very interesting is that um, if we look at by the income uh, quartiles, then you will see that uh, poor people in Estonia are more likely uh, to have internet access at home than poor people in Slovenia. Okay? So, uh, in other words, you know, poor people in Estonia are poorer in both absolute and, you know, poor people in Estonia, both in absolute and relative terms, they are more likely to use internet or have at least access to the internet home than in Slovenia. So again, I think uh, that kind of um, relates to this idea that, uh, you know, demand for internet is, is not something given, it's really a, de you know, like derived demand. There are lots of subsidies available and it really depends on you know, what kind of mental model do you have and what kind of things do you perceive important and on what are you willing to spend money. Some, some other sort of uh, um, interesting data, for instance, if you look at the, um, uh, 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 females, older ladies, right, then you will see that, um, um, uh, you know, the, this is a percentage of people who have used uh, internet in the last three months. Uh, you will again see that both in you know, older age, age groups uh, there are some differences. Uh, again, like uh, older people are more likely uh, to use internet in, Slovenia, in Estonia than in Slovenia. And uh, if you look at the same data, uh, basically um, uh, along the you know the groups of uh, um, females versus males, uh, sort of the similar trend emerges that uh, uh, you know. Uh, um, Estonian use of internet uh, uh, tends to be sort of considerably higher than in Slovenia. So those are just some of the data points. There is um, sort of the paper I've written on that uh, uses much sort of rich, richer data, but those are just some of the data points, uh, data points to illustrate that. So, um, so from from moving from this, um, I'm sorry, I'm just not used to this mic, so uh, it's, it's a bit, um, yeah. So I have to be very static here. Uh, but from moving from this sort of comparison of Estonia to uh, uh, Estonia and Slovenia and looking at some of the Estonian cases, uh, we have this uh, nice quote from uh, Barack Obama from the last year when he was in Thailand, where he actually was supposed to talk about, uh, and he did talk about national security, uh, international security issues, but he also uh, said a few words about uh, innovation, and it was it was quite interesting to see uh, in that context that in in the later also later in the press conference um, he was asked about um, 
um, the problems with the US uh, healthcare website, right? And he said something that, well, you should have called the Estonian programmers uh, to fix the website, which is a little, a little bit ironic because uh, not everything with uh, uh, public sector IT is well in Estonia, and healthcare is actually one of the problems uh, that we have. So we have, we have had four initiatives, and we can clearly say that uh, three out of the four have actually failed, right? So, so this picture is probably too nice, right? Uh, but uh, there is some, um, uh, or this quote is probably too nice. Uh, there is, you know, there are some good things, some bad things, and I want to elaborate a little bit, like why some things have worked out and why some other things uh, have not worked out so well, and what might be some of the reasons behind it. Uh, so, uh, so I, I have. I have this sort of uh, title that basically my argument is that some of the things that have been uh, successful behind that is uh, uh, entrepreneurial discovery um, uh, and relatively sort of uh, uh, simple rules or uh, uh, not, not too much sort of institutional uh, um, uh, complexity. Um, uh, something that um, um, I think it's uh, quite important that um, this kind of uh, springboard, uh, springboard uh, um, uh, um, for all of that is an introduction of internet banking um, 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 and uh, government is actually uh, starting to use this platform and building on those services in, uh, in uh, 2000. So, um, and, um, and again, like, this is something that encourages people to uh, use uh, uh, those online platforms from, uh, uh, more and more and on the basis of that uh, uh, national ID card is introduced and um, you have uh, in from 2000, in 2005 you have internet voting which is uh, um, you know relies on this uh, national ID method so here is uh, um, here is um, also, you know, entrepreneurial discovery that has also worked quite well in in some of the cases uh, of the um, um, uh, private sector companies. Uh, you have emergence of Skype, right? Uh, but uh, we have to keep in mind that Skype emerged as a result of the experience of the people who founded Skype had with the uh, app called Gaza. Okay, and Gaza was a file file sharing app that was um, actually for uh, illegal downloading of uh, music and uh, movies. And uh, those guys were for a while fugitives from the US justice system. And once they made this first $2.6 billion, uh, uh, they used about 100 million of that to settle the lawsuits in the US, okay? So there is this sort of uh, very different con uh, context to that. And, um, um, and uh, TransferWise actually is also founded, one of the, founded by one of the ex-employees of Skype. Um, he calls himself the first employee of the Skype. And um, TransferWise is quite interesting because it uh, combines um, uh, you know, two important innovations. One is sort of uh, internet banking uh, experience, digitalization of the internet banking and also peer-to-peer -peer technology. So here are some of the data points. So this was very you know, simple terms, the story. Uh, here are some of the key data points. Uh, so if you look at the internet banking um, 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 in Estonia, and we compare it with uh, Central Eastern Europe um, and uh, EU average, we'll see that uh, about 70% of uh, Estonians uh, Estonian residents uh, aged 16 to 74 uh, um, um, currently use internet banking, right? And this sort of percentage, Estonia is this yellow line there, this percentage actually has been uh, uh, kind of high in comparative perspective uh, from the 2004 um, until now, while the EU average is sort of slightly over 40%, and uh, you will see that. Uh, some of the countries in Central Eastern Europe, such as Romania and Bulgaria, only have sort of four and five percent of uh, individuals who actually use internet banking. So this is quite crucial. So when I, um, so here is you know one more sort of data point, sort of um, uh, uh, comparing Estonia and uh, 
Slovenia. And I think it's interesting in that sense is that uh, what really sort of drives the internet traffic. Obviously there is a Facebook, there is a Google and so on. But in Estonia, the eighth most popular website is actually sweatbank.e, okay? So um, in Slovenia, it's, uh, so this is like the global traffic, right? You will see that actually, um, that's, the, that's the red line. That's the sweatbank.e, okay? So this is the global ranking. Um, um, uh, keep in mind that Estonia has 1.3 million inhabitants, Slovenia has uh, 2 million, right? In Slovenia, uh, one of the most popular sort of uh, domestic websites is actually government.si, okay? So it's a government portal. In Estonia, the government portal, which is asti.ee, which is this sort of dark blue line in the very bottom, is not very popular, okay? So that's not even in top 100. Okay, so people don't use the government website as much. They use some other government websites. I have some here like RIC, which is, uh, which is like the business registry or that type of stuff. You see this is sort of the dark green line here. But um, Slovenian most popular bank is this uh, light green uh, line. So you see that this is, this is, this is not um, in the global ranking, it's not very, very heavily used. I think in Slo among the Slovenian ranking, it's, it's not even in top 50 or so. And uh, this is actually government-owned bank, okay? So, uh, so there is a very, again, like to highlight this, you know, highlight those differences, there is a very different approach uh, uh, what and how people, you know, do online. Again, like uh, I try to emphasize this sort of epistemological nature of technology, sort of, dif you know, different types of uses in different contexts depending on a number of social, political, economic, and other factors. So, uh, um, so, yeah. So, in 1996, when I went to uh, what was then a Hansa Bank, which was not owned by Swedes, it was a Estonian startup company. Okay, so Hansa Bank was a startup company founded in the early 1990s. Okay, when I went to Hansa Bank in 1996. Uh, to, f to do some transaction, and the lady asked me that, why are you here? Why don't you do that at home? Why don't you do that online, right? And she gave me that kind of card, okay? So this is the old identification method uh, that, we, uh, that we used, uh, uh, and still, you, you, are, you actually you can use it in Estonia to, um, <clears throat> um, you can still use it to access banking services online, and obviously when this is introduced, by government in 2002, then it builds on this experience, okay? So you already have a wide use of internet banking. Um, people are used to access online services uh, through internet banking using those old-fashioned ID cards. And then uh, government introduces this national ID card, which is compulsory to have, but it's not compulsory to uh, use it online, right? Um, and um, <clears throat> they introduce it, but um, in the beginning, it's not really popular to use it online, okay? It only becomes popular when banks start to discriminate against the users of that type of technology or, or identification method, meaning that um, it's very difficult with that to make large transactions, okay? So if you want to make a bigger transactions, you actually have to use the ID card. So the only reason I think why this ID card becomes um, uh, more widely used is because uh, telecom companies, uh, banks, uh, they kind of back this. This is sort of, you know, you could call it private-public partnership or, uh, and so on. So it's not just that the government introduces, makes it compulsory, then people start using it. So, and, uh, you know, the next step is that about a year ago, um, Estonians thought that, well, let's make it global, uh, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this project that everybody in the world who wants it, right, uh, can have it. So, um, so we aim at 10 million e-residents uh, by, I think, uh, 25, right, so in 10 years or so. Um, uh, currently, I think thousands of them have been issued. But again, it, we'd be talking about platform economy, Okay, so this is sort of one, one, one idea of this, how you can actually implement this platform economy that you have this sort of identification method, you can do digital signatures, you can access banking services, government services, everything, so you can actually go ahead and uh, use it. So, 
Um, but a very important thing to keep in mind is that, so I said in 1996, entrepreneurial startup banks introduced internet banking. In uh, 2000, the Estonian tax authority said, before we had national ID card, they said, okay, banks are offering this platform, let's use it, okay? Let's allow people to declare taxes online. And I see that also as part of the entrepreneurial discovery, okay? So basically, they were willing to go ahead and do something like that, and, and nobody said no. Said that, okay, this law and that law does not allow you to do that. You have to do your own system, or you're not allowed to use the platforms provided by the banks. And currently, this is the uh, picture I took yesterday from the tax authority website, you will see that they offer something like 10 different identification methods, including uh, including uh, seven banks, okay? So you can log in with your national ID card, you can log in with a mobile ID card, you can also have some kind of password-based system. So, so the point is that it's very diverse, so you, you, you don't kind of discriminate. You're still allowed to use the old-fashioned old methods that have almost been around for uh, 20 years. So, and um, uh, why is this has been possible? Uh, one reason for that is that um, um, the system has been relatively decentralized. There is, uh, in the center of that is something we call X-Road, uh, which is developed by an Estonian company called uh, Cybernetica, which is, um, uh, now it's a private company. It used to be a government company. It was privatized. But it really has a long history. It's linked to the um, uh, Soviet Institute of Cybernetics that was based in Tallinn. And when Estonia became independent, then they decided that, well, sort of theoretical research will stay with the university uh, and uh, applied research will be moved to the, uh, uh, this company. And they have introduced something called uh, X-Road, which, which allows different systems, older legacy systems, to talk to each other. It also allows systems, different systems that public and private sector use to talk to each other. Okay? So this is very, very, very crucial. And, but it's very important. It's not as, you know, something that I have tried to emphasize throughout my research is that it's not a centralized approach. So this is a possibility. Um, um, you know, private sector can cooperate, um, public sector can cooperate, but there are, um, you know, some public sector initiatives have been more successful, others have not been very successful, depending on how they have been implemented and so on. So, so this is very, um, I think it's, it's quite important uh, to understand in this context. Well, just to, just to build on that is um, uh, in 2005, uh, government introduced um, uh, internet voting, which has been uh, uh, relatively, uh, 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 you know, popular recently. As you can see from this data in the last elections, about a third of all votes that were submitted were sub submitted online. Um, uh, at the same time, it's kind of difficult to argue that uh, more people vote online, higher the turnout. Okay, as you can see from the data, for instance, look at the European Parliament election, you have a one third of the votes uh, submitted uh, via internet, but at the same time, uh, the turnout is relatively low, right? So it's, it's, this is sort of a difficult argument to make. But what is even more interesting, I'm, I'm bringing, I don't want to spend like too much time talking about internet voting, but uh, what is more interesting here is that uh, I mentioned before that this national ID card uh, was not immediately popular uh, for, for the use in the online environments. And you can, see, you can see here this data that actually a very significant percentage of people who voted online, this is the column, um, who voted online were the first time users of ID card uh, in online environments uh, in those elections. So now, of course, it's not an issue anymore but that, that, that again sort of demonstrates this idea that uh, you, you had those alternative identification methods that you were able to use through the banks and uh, in that sense, uh, mm, uh, um, you know, they, they, they didn't sort of adopt it immediately, okay? So there were early adopters, you know, in terms of the diffusion, in, in diffusion of innovation theory, 
but sort of the maturity came along like much, much later. And currently you kind of see the similar process happening with the mobile ID, uh, where you, you see that increasing number of uh, uh, internet votes are uh, submitted with the use of the uh, mobile ID. So, and uh, here is a little bit about the distribution. I said that, um, uh, you know, I, saw, I showed this uh, quote from Milner and said that this is a very rational choice for me. And I think this is, you know, one of the, one of the tables where, where I could actually elaborate on that. What we see here is that we see the um, distribution of internet votes among the, along the lines, among the different political parties. And uh, I don't know how much you know about Estonian politics, but Center Party, headed by a guy called Edgar Savisar, is actually one of the most popular parties in Estonia. It's, 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 it's basically as popular as a reform party, depending on the elections we're looking at. But you will see here that the Center Party constantly gets very low share of internet votes, okay? Um, you know, it would be at least, if it would be like, you know, pro proportional, their overall share, they should at least get something like 20% or 25%, but they tend to get, uh, in the last elections, uh, 9, 6, and so on, okay? And here, um, um, uh, they perceive it as a, as a, as a sort of, uh, the perception of, that they have is that basically, internet voting somehow takes votes away, away from them and gives it to the other parties. But as I tried to argue before, it does not increase the turnout. Okay? If, it doesn't, if it doesn't increase the turnout, then it's not really taking any votes away from anybody. Okay? It's just that the supporters of the center party are not very active users of the internet, so they are less likely to use it as an alternative method for voting. But at least the perception is that uh, you know, internet voting works against their interests, okay? which I think is... Uh, is kind of wrong, okay? So who are those guys? <laughs> so those are the same guys I mentioned that uh, uh, <clears throat> in the early years when they founded the Skype, who also founded the Gaza, and then uh, were able to sell... Uh, uh, so those are the Estonian programs. You also have a Dane, uh, Janus Fries, and Swede, Niklas Sandström, who, mo who moved in the late 1990s uh, um, from Sweden and Denmark to uh, Thailand, they put the ad in the newspaper that uh, um, uh, supermodels not wanted, we want your brain. So those guys uh, called them up. First they developed a portal called everyday.com, it doesn't exist anymore. At that time everybody developed portals in the late 1990s. Then they developed Kaza, and then they, you know, uh, developed uh, uh, developed um, um, Skype, and um, the funny thing about that is that uh, uh, I'm sorry, the text is a little bit um, has been a bit misplaced because of the, yeah, the difference between the computers. But I, I think you can read it. So the funny thing about this is that if, if you look at um, you know if you look at Estonia or, or the quote that I I showed you also before. Uh, from Barack Obama, often people get the perception that uh, Skype had Skype had something to do with uh, Estonian uh, uh, government policy, uh, but the fact is that it's, it's a relatively sort of accidental that it happened, right? If you, if you look at this quote, uh, uh, which is about the early years of the uh, uh, Skype, you will see that. Uh, it has more to do, perhaps, with sort of bohemian culture in the, in the in the in the pubs and clubs of Thailand, rather than sort of active government involvement. I mean, there was no government involvement. And if you if you read this quote, it's quite amazing that a bit later the same guys were able to raise 2.6 billion dollars <coughs> um, and uh, actually um, uh, become themselves uh, 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 millionaires. So, um, so again, it's a bit of an accidental process where the entrepreneurial discovery takes place. Uh, what Richard Florida of the University of Toronto has called a creative, uh, creative classes, right? So you have like a you know, IT guys, or designers, you have artists, and they kind of like hang out, and uh, you facilitate this openness and tolerance, and then perhaps 
great things happen and good, uh, good ideas come along. So it's not very much about sort of top-down engineering that they want to create the Skype and now it happens. So there hasn't been any, anything as successful, I think, um, um, after, after Skype um, in Estonia. Uh, uh, TransferWise has uh, similar chances. Um, Skype, uh, obviously, in the beginning expanded in Estonia. Uh, they have something like 400 employees in Estonia. But uh, most of the expansion uh, has taken place uh, outside, outside of Estonia after that. So who are those guys? <laughs> well, the guy, on, uh, the guy on this side with the blonde hair is actually, according to the Estonian business newspaper, the richest guy in Estonia. <laughs> And the guy uh, here with dark hair, Tavet, he's uh, the third richest guy. <laughs> so Tavet uh, uh, here, he's, uh, he was actually, he, he says that he, Tavet uh, yeah, on, on left, right, he, he's, he, he was also um, the first employee of Skype, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> and as I said, uh, TransferWise uh, builds on, it's basically sort of Skype of financial technology by making, uh, uh, transfers cheaper, um, also making uh, it faster. I use it every month uh, to transfer money from Estonia to the US. It's, I don't know, if, if it usually would cost me 24 euros to make a wire transfer to the US, plus my US bank would charge uh, $20, then with transfer wise it's two or three euros, right? And it often also takes only 24 hours, while the bank it would take two or three days. So there is it's a considerable sort of uh, financial innovation. It's uh, um, probably the second most important Estonian startup, valued currently over a billion dollars. They're based in London. They was founded in London, as I mentioned, but they're, I think, currently they hire a couple of hundred uh, people in Estonia as well. So their development center is actually in Tallinn. So they have sim similar sort of. Uh, employment number of employees in Thailand, you know, as, as Skype. So it's, it's, in that sense, it's a major, uh, major sort of uh, uh, player, and it was not backed by government, okay? So there is no government intervention here. It's a process of entrepreneurial discovery. I don't know how, how many of you have read the story, but uh, the story was basically that Christo was Karman, the blonde guy, he was working in London, making money in bounds, but he had mortgage payments in Tallinn. <laughs> uh, and and, uh, and uh, with David, he was in London, but he made all his money, I think, I think he was still at that time paid by Skype, he made all his money in euros, uh, and it was transferred to his Tallinn bank account. Uh, and then they decided to make this private arrangement, right, where they are basically switching uh, the payments among themselves. And after that, TransferWise is all about scaling it up. Okay? And they've been quite successful. You, you made a Peter Thiel, who's a, you know, behind PayPal. Um, Andres and Horowitz, major Silicon Valley, venture capital firm. Um, and also Richard Branson, the rebel billionaire, all have backed this uh, venture. So, so, those are, uh, so those are basically sort of uh, examples. I, I don't have very much time to go into details and so on, but those are examples, I think, where sort of entrepreneurial discovery process have, has worked quite well. So, and I would argue that to a great extent it has been somewhat accidental. It has been sort of success without strategy. Um, um, and the main role of the government really here has been trying to create relatively simple rules, uh, sort of liberalizing, opening up, privatizing, and so on. And um, if, we, if we saw the use of taking over or you know, applying or using some of those uh, 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 private sector platforms and uh, other um, IT in the public sector, I think it fit very well with the political reforms and economic reforms that were carried out in Estonia in the 1990s and in 2000s, where the aim was to make uh, things more efficient, uh, reduce the size of the government. Um, but it, it was relatively decentralized, relatively cost-effective way of doing things. There were no sort of huge uh, uh, you know, white elephants created, and, and those failures that they mentioned also, I think they, they haven't been as, as uh, costly. So, 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 so this is basically the story. So now on the, 
a little bit on the uh, other side of the story. So all those examples made um, you know, great impression that Estonia is a very good in innovation, <coughs> which is not true. Uh, so here we see this uh, ranking uh, that the EU produces each year, which is um, a European Innovation Scoreboard. You actually see that Estonia is a moderate innovator. Okay, it's not a very, um, you know, it, you know, it's not above the EU average or anything like that. If you look at the research and development spending, okay, you will see that the trend is actually for a while it was upwards, but now the trend is actually downwards. And it primarily has to do with the private sector research and development spending. So the private sector uh, spends uh, less and less. But there is sort of one statistical issue here, namely that uh, they count the Estonian energy company in private sector, uh, which is actually a state-owned company. And one reason why it was growing in 2011, 2012 so much is uh, as a percentage of GDP, is because, uh, sorry, the, the slide is about this, as a percentage of GDP, uh, was because of the investments in uh, oil, oil businesses. Um, and so this is sort of the R&D spending by sector. You see that uh, uh, in addition to uh, information and communication technologies, oil production is even even bigger player. Okay, so very significant uh, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, investments goes there. But keep in mind that, what Steve Jobs has said on uh, research and development, right? So innovation is not just about R&D money, right? So uh, it's, it's about how do you apply it, how do you use it? And um, as I sort of tried to emphasize in some, some, uh, um, some uh, uh, areas like IT, um, you know, where entrepreneurial discovery has, has worked, uh, it has worked quite well without very extensive, if you think about companies like Skype or, or TransferWise, it's about sort of using already existing technology and combining it, right? So it's not so much about sort of extensive research uh, and then uh, trying to apply it. And, um, and yeah, as Steve Jobs has said, it's about the people um, that you have, how you lead them, and, uh, and how, they, how much do they actually understand what they are doing, right? So in this in this sense, like one way how to look at that is sort of uh, high tech high tech exports. Um, you know, we, sorry, it's a bit messy picture, but uh, Estonia is the sort of very bright yellow line there, um, um, and the high tech exports is a percentage of uh, total exports are about uh, fifteen percent. So it means that and there's been quite a quite a rapid growth, meaning that. Uh, uh, maybe the situation is not as bad as this R R and D and the EU innovation scoreboard indicators um, show. Um, so some of the issues, I think, uh, some of the big issues uh, we have is that um, um, when I, I, I lived about ten years outside of Estonia um, in the UK and US. And when I moved back, I noticed that um, a lot of things have changed, right? And one thing that had changed is that lots of people were going around and talking about government support, okay? Government grants and that kind of uh, measures. And something that I have been interested in my research is that um, um, actually how much they have helped, okay? And how helpful they have been. And here is a sort of the big picture. Um, so this is the allocation of the EU structural funds. A lot of that funds uh, are used for innovation. So those are only sort of uh, funds for innovation. And you have uh, two types of measures. Uh, the red one is basically direct grants you give to the businesses to support uh, uh, support um, innovation. And the blue one is about financial instruments. Those are loans, loan guarantees, venture capital, and so on. grants. Then now the emphasis is more on financial in instruments and overall the, overall the total amount uh, that government spends, plans to spend, is actually in a decline. Okay? So this is in millions of euros. So we have done, um, I'm sorry, the, the uh, um, uh, slides are a bit off, but we have, we have done um, a paper with Ricardo Vicente who is a um, Portuguese uh, uh, economist from the European University Institute. 
where we basically uh, used uh, propensity score matching. So this is sort of the econometric part of uh, my research at, um, um, agenda, uh, where we built up a huge database that covered all the companies who have received grants um, in uh, 2007 to 2012, and uh, we basically found that 52% uh, uh, of the funds were allocated to uh, technology investment grants, um, and those technology investment grants or grants were number of recipients is very small, amounts are relatively large, um, and often those projects have very low risk, meaning that often companies could actually fund them themselves, okay, without the government support. You know, they pay off relatively quickly, um, and uh, um, and we kind of argue in this paper that uh, Estonian government has uh, uh, picked winners, right? And, and in this context, uh, it means that it's not good, right? Because uh, you know. I don't know how, how familiar you are with this sort of idea of uh, picking winning, winner syndrome, but, uh, but basically the notion is that uh, um, you should try to finance, uh, if, if you do that type of financing, you should probably try to finance more the companies who are less likely um, to get uh, financing from the private sector, right? If you purposefully go out there and try to f find successful projects, uh, then you're not actually doing what you're supposed to be doing with this money, right? So, could, because those companies could also get uh, financing uh, from the private sector. So, so basically, we say that over half of this money has been allocated this uh, this way, and that's why we have called our paper that uh, you know basically government is picking big winners and small losers, right? And um, uh, and we see that uh, relatively little amount of money has been allocated to the risky. R&D projects, where perhaps the likelihood is more likely that maybe private sector don't have the sufficient in, in incentives to, to finance it. Um, again, this paper is available on my ResearchGate uh, website. Uh, you can download it from here. This is this year's paper, but this is also, so sort of the snapshot of the econometrics that we found. So this is uh, uh, here um, is a tech is a technology investment grant. We see a very strong correlation. Uh, if you look at value added per employee, we see also in uh, cross profits, uh, we see also correlation in export revenue and sales revenue, uh, and we also see in uh, labor cost. But if you look, look at some of the other uh, instruments uh, that the government is using, like knowledge and skills grants, we see that it's actually negatively correlated with value added per employee, right? So, meaning that it doesn't actually help you to. Uh, uh, grow uh, productivity. Um, same with uh, R&D grants, also with startup grants, and so and so. So, so this is uh, this is uh, um, um, this is sort of the uh, uh, econometric uh, uh, econometric part of the paper um, uh, using propensity score score matching. So another thing I have been um, looking at is uh, government venture capital. Okay, a bit more closely. And in the case of government venture capital, uh, so this, this is sort of the characterization of the ecosystem. Uh, we see that the government venture capital fund is there uh, in the middle, and you have all those sort of different uh, companies they have financed or are sort of connected to in one way or another. But the issue there is that uh, um, we have three exits, okay, out of 18 companies where government has invested. But we don't really know uh, the terms of the exits. Okay? We don't know how successful they have been. You know, some of them I speculate have been quite successful, such as Crabcat, which is a Estonian company now primarily based in Boston, and they also have some employees in Thailand. Um, uh, but you have also uh, failed investments, some of them in the social uh, networking business. You know, portal for the cat and dog owners, United Cats and Dogs. Um, and uh, but they have lots of investments in the grey area, and um, and in many ways it's very difficult to judge whether that type of strategy has been um, uh, successful or not. And uh, um, and um, obviously, you know, I emphasize this idea of institutional complexity in the beginning. Here you have here you run into this issue very very much because one of the things 
that makes venture capital successful is that venture capital is a form of private equity, okay? And uh, one key thing about private equity is that it's private, okay? Uh, you can use, exploit information asymmetries. You have information that other others don't have and you can make investment decisions on the, on the basis of that. But uh, if you bring in the government, then the government is not about, you know, uh, being private, right? It's, it's, it's public, right? So you have this sort of governmental transparency. And those two things, I think, in this model are very much in conflict with each other. And obviously, there have been some elements of rent seating. You know, sometimes some of the companies that have been funded are the ones that uh, um, are connected uh, with the venture. And uh, various uh, CEOs of the fund have been fired because of some of the expenditure issues, you know, spending too much money on uh, wrong things and so on. And currently, this organization is actually in the crisis. And uh, uh, the plan is to move to a completely different system and uh, hand, hand over the portfolio. So, 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 so those are some of the concerns. So, it would, you know, since um, I have to uh, wrap it up at some point, um, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do in this research uh, is to connect the literature on institutional economics, on institutions, with that of entrepreneurial discovery and uh, technology diffusion. And in, in that sense, uh, through various methods, bring also in not only formal institutions, formal institutions such as laws, regulations, those are relatively easy to measure, but also through interviews and other, uh, other, other, other methods, try to bring in this sort of more informal in, 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 insight. And the key argument is that, uh, uh, why some of those things have been successful or relatively successful or worked out more or less fine is that uh, there's been uh, uh, facilitation of this entrepreneurial discovery process, okay? And, uh, um, uh, but once uh, you have, uh, um, you know, too much institutional complexity, too much regulations, uh, it becomes, you know, very, very complex, you know, different, uh, uh, ways of behavior uh, start conflicting with each other, then uh, the, those policy outcomes or what you're actually trying to achieve to become, you know, this is very diplomatically, but to become more heterogeneous, meaning that, well, you cannot expect uh, uh, good outcomes that uh, you, you expected or, you know, they may be you know, closer to the failure, right? And uh, one of the key implications of uh, um, uh, this is that, uh, you know, entrepreneurial discovery process, right, is something that should be encouraged. So in the EU, for instance, for instance when we talk about uh, uh, di digital single market, then um, I think the question is not that we will come up with some kind of new strategy or new platform and so on. I think the question is more about what kind of barriers we can uh, remove that actually doesn't allow this entrepreneurial discovery process uh, um, uh, to flourish, right? And uh, mm, and another an, uh, sort of another very um, you know important issue is this institutional complexity that you actually you know have to try to reduce it. Uh, otherwise, you cannot expect uh, um, you know good outcomes in uh, technology diffusion. and you cannot expect uh, um, you know, some kind of new interesting developments that I sort of try to describe to take place. Uh, obviously, it's not a guarantee. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm more in talking about it in terms of likelihoods. You know, you, you cannot say that, well, this is sort of completely uh, sufficient uh, uh, condition. And once you do it, everything, good things will happen. And, you know, as I mentioned before, I think, at least in the Estonian context, I don't know, maybe the same in Lithuania or some of the other countries where, you know, I think there has been too much talk about sort of like government support measures um, uh, and there has been sort of too much dependency on all kind of grants and financial instruments created uh, in this area of innovation and research and development, right? And uh, I, I think the key uh, here is really to sort of start thinking a bit more differently, maybe think a little bit more um, uh, in terms of what Steve Jobs said, that it's not so much about R&D dollars, but it's more about how you manage and lead the people. If you want to have good outcomes, innovation, so that implies uh, uh, sort of change in the mental model or the way we think about the world. But this is obviously very difficult, right?
So, thank you. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. Uh, in your presentation, you showed a couple of beautiful graphs where, sadly enough, Lithuania is not at the forefront of the I'm sorry, yeah. Or, or an expert <laughs> of uh, high technology. Maybe you could give some advice on, 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 on what should we do to improve that? Except for, of course, okay. the Steve Jobs uh, slide that you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, it didn't happen, but let me go back. Actually, maybe I wasn't completely honest as well. Uh, so, uh, um, oh, you meant the high tech export slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I wasn't actually very honest about it. Uh, I didn't want to, yeah, yeah, wanted to rush over it. I, I think like one reason why Estonia, uh, in Estonia, this high tech uh, exports go up where they go up there, right, has to do with Ericsson factory. Okay. Ericsson moved its production to Estonia. There is a really huge uh, Ericsson factory in Estonia, which is about 10% of Estonian exports is actually Ericsson. Okay, so it's, a, it's it's not a mobile phone assembly, but it's a bit more sophisticated sort of mobile uh, communications technology. We have like two factories. One is in uh, one is in uh, China, one is in Estonia, and I think in this high tech exports, they classify uh, this sort of like electronics assembly as a high tech, even if it may, may not be as high tech as doing something, you know, like, I don't know, maybe TransferWise or Skype or something like that. But it, it's still quite, quite, you know, I think the value added is about average. So it's, it, it's, it's not like, you know, you know, it's not as bad as mobile phone assembly. Mobile phone assembly tends to be relatively low tech, actually. But because it's electronics, it sometimes gets classified as a high tech. So maybe the picture is not as good uh, as, I, as I implied. So, and uh, uh, because of this, this sort of factor may over, over, um, um, overemphasize the high tech exports. But uh, it doesn't, you know. Still, you know, I think uh, so. So maybe there is not much that in this case uh, Lithuania can learn from Estonia. But I think the same thing that I tried to say about Estonia also works in uh, Lithuania. That. Uh, I think the key is that uh, um, try to reduce the sort of institutional complexity. I know some of that has come because of the EU membership, right? So this is something I have experienced a lot. But I think um, also there is um, there there are differences. How do you how do you interpret the different rules, right? And you can you can have actually more flexibility in interpreting different rules. And perhaps um, you know this is one way how to reduce this complexity. Another way, another way is sort of um, uh, promote this entrepreneur, entrepreneurship or, or entrepreneurial discovery. And this is not just a, uh, by promoting it, I don't mean that uh, uh, you have to give them some kind of financial support or something like that, but it's more about like talking about it and saying, you know, what I, what I try to do here is saying that this is very important, right? So we should understand the benefit of entrepreneurship is not something uh, linear, uh, something very simple, it's actually very messy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, for instance, in Estonia, we have this huge debate about um, um, IT companies are complaining that, uh, um, um, that they have hired foreign employees. Uh, now there are bureaucratic regulations are a bit easier than they used to be. They can move to Estonia, but there is lots of hatred, particularly in the second largest city in, in, uh, of Tartu, you know, uh, when, you, when you're a foreigner and you work walk around there, you can be beaten up or, you know, people say nasty things and so on. And, and uh, you know, maybe the, you know, those are those issues as well, sort of related to the overall, like, openness and sort of social acceptance and tolerance and uh, that kind of issues that also uh, help to get the point across that, uh, um, you know, if you want to be entrepreneurial, then we should also, you know, uh, bring in other entrepreneurs and allow them to work here and, uh, contribute and so on. So I think that's, it, it's more like soft issues, you know, as if it's not about something, you know, that, I don't know, change immediately this law or give money to this guy or don't give, him, give money to this guy. It's more about sort of like attitude and mental models and that kind of things. And, and obviously like think tanks like uh, free market institutes can do that. I mean, you just talk about those issues and trying to explain rationally why they are important, right? and how those sort of social liberties and tolerance are connected with the economic development and innovation and all those 
great things. You know, as they nowadays say that uh, I mentioned, I mentioned Steve Jobs. You know, you, you all know that that uh, Steve Jobs is uh, uh, comes from the family of uh, Syrian immigrants, right, to the U.S. So, right. So this is just one, you know, one example that lots of people give it uh, today. Right. Any other questions? Yeah, please. What about the workforce in, in Estonia? Because it's a very small country, the, the number of people is increasing, and how this problem is solved, and uh, mm -hmm. what is the future of Estonia? Mm -hmm. This is, uh, thank you, this is a very important question. Uh, uh, and this is something that IT companies complain about a lot. And that's related to this, this sort of previous point that they want to bring in more and more foreigners, but they see this sort of increasing intolerance towards foreigners, and they're a bit like worried about that. And uh, in that sense, uh, um, um, uh, it, is, it is a very tough situation. Uh, I mean, uh, I know that France Wise actually has been sort of uh, aggressively trying to attract over the employees of Skype and other companies, and, and that sort of limits the expansion of uh, IT companies uh, um, and you know, also um, companies in some other sectors. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, for instance, why probably Skype has not expanded so much in Estonia because they simply cannot find enough, uh, you know, qualified workers. So there is a, it, it, it's a serious issue in IT sector, it's also serious issue in uh, many other sectors because companies increasingly, um, we have very low level of unemployment, about uh, 6%, and, and companies increasingly are, are increasingly are not able to find qualified staff who have the skill level that, uh, would match their needs, and uh, also have you have declining uh, population. So the, the key answer is that uh, uh, I guess you have to use use more and more technology. You have to sort of uh, increase the productivity of the worker. Perhaps do the things that uh, don't require that many workers. Right. So uh, you, you obviously cannot compute, uh, compete with uh, um, um, countries. Uh, um, where you have like uh, huge amounts of workers available, sort of find your own market niches and so on. So uh, there is there is no easy answer to that. There is no easy easy solution. But it is certainly a problem. So one of the biggest problems we have. Yeah, please. Um, how high technology impacts Lithuania? Lithuania. Yes. Um, I think it uh, affects uh, like in any other any other country. Uh, I haven't sort of studied so carefully uh, uh, Lithuania, but uh, uh, just your general viewpoint. What do you think? What do I think? Uh, <clears throat> um, well, I, I know that you also have a, quite a lot of sort of uh, startups here, here in Vilnius, right? So uh, um, and. Um, I, I, I guess um, this is something that um, you know you should sort of like encourage or celebrate and uh, try to um, you know have more of them. Um, but it's not also about uh, startups. Uh, um, I think uh, one very crucial issue is that how you're able to use those high high technologies such as well high IT better in the traditional industries. Okay, so this is sort of like horizontal IT, okay, sort of using it in different sectors that are not maybe very IT, uh, you know, savvy, right? So this is this is sort of the key question. Uh, um, I, I assume also in the case of Lithuania. So, uh, and um, and I think that's that's where you can get lots of um, sort of productivity gains and other sort of. Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, other benefits, basically, if you're better at using it, uh, um, sectors outside of uh, um, um, IT sector. So, yeah. So, sorry, I, I, I haven't sort of looked very close to Lithuania, but that's just sort of my general uh, comment. But you think Lithuania uh, are doing the right way? Um, sh sure, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that Lithuania is doing everything uh, right way, yeah, let me, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there are certain things. I mean, I think I think you're doing. Uh, if you look at this, for instance, I, I show here internet banking, right? So you see that, uh, yeah. So Lithuania is somewhere here. Obviously, you could maybe. So there is there is some room for improvement, but again, like in comparison with EU average or a bunch of other Central Eastern European countries, it's uh, it's not so bad. Um, I know that you have also this uh, debate about, uh, I had some discussions this week and uh, I had before today, uh, today's lecture about internet voting, right? I mean, it's, I mean, I don't want to say that, it, you know, I, I did some slides, in, oh, sorry, internet voting. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't want to, I don't want to overemphasize it, right? Um, I don't want to say that this is sort of uh, the coolest and the best innovation that has ever taken place, but um, uh, but it, it's sort of like a nice thing to have, right? Uh, and why not to why not to do it, right? So um, uh, again, like maybe it doesn't have the benefits that some some people think it, it, it they have, but at least it will make sort of voting easier and more convenient for some people. And uh, why not to use this option, right? So this is uh, something uh, something on top of that. So uh, yeah, so yeah, so it seems there are some 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 areas where you could have some improvement, but I would say that probably encouraging more use of internet banking is more important than encouraging the people to vote online or something, right? So um, yeah, maybe sort of a skills issue or uh, some some other issue. I haven't looked at very closely at the data, but uh, I, I could obviously do that. So uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, anybody? Uh, thank you very much. Uh,